Hello, students. Welcome to video lesson 612, um, the first part of it. This, in this video, we're going to try to expand um, our knowledge of solving trig equations that we were looking at in our last videos. Um, it's important for us to recognize that in our last videos, we were solving trig equations that uh, were very nice, right? Because the values we're all from our unit circle, right? So we, we were able to solve equations like, like this one, like sine of x is equal to a half, right? We can look on our unit circle and find where is the sine of x equal to a half. Same thing with sine of x equals radical three over two. We can look on our unit circle and figure out where is the sine of x radical three over two. We can do the same with sine of x equals zero, right? Or cosine for any of these. Um, but what we're eventually going to have to be able to do is we're going to have to sort of broaden our horizons and be able to solve trig equations that do not come from our unit circle. Okay, for example, sine of x is equal to 1.4. What values of x allow me to get a sine value that's 1.4? What values of x allow me to get a sine value of 0 0.3, right? So we're solving sine of x equals 0 0.3, figuring out what x values would work for that. So these things we cannot use a unit circle for, okay? So eventually, in, in this video and the next, we're gonna to try to broaden our horizons, um, looking at how do we solve trig equations where the answers don't necessarily come right from our unit circle, okay? Um, before we get, get into that, um, just a quick reminder about inverse functions, because, spoiler alert, we're gonna do this, we're gonna solve these equations with sine and cosine inverse, okay? So that's, uh, you know, sine with the negative one next to it, which we have worked with a little bit in the past, um, specifically when we've been looking for side lengths of triangles or, or angles in a triangle, I should say. We've been using sine inverse. Okay, so sine inverse of whatever, right? There's a button for it on our calculator and we'll get more familiar with that shortly. But it's important to remember that when we have an inverse function, it basically undoes whatever the function originally did, right? So a function f of x and its inverse, f inverse of x, undo each other. So when we put them together, they basically, they cancel each other out, right? They, they undo each other. So whenever you have like a composition of functions like this, if one of them is f, whatever that function is, and the other is f inverse, well, they just sort of cancel each other out and you're just left with x. Same if that f inverse is outside and the f on the inside, it doesn't matter, okay? So when we look at sine and cosine, the same thing is true. If we have the sine inverse of the sine of x, the sine and the sine inverse just sort of cancel each other out and we're left with just x. The same with cosine, excuse me. So if I have the sine of x equals something and I put a sine inverse in front of it, Okay, the sine inverse and the sine basically cancel each other out, and this whole side of the equation then is just going to say x. All right, so we're going to deal with that more in just a minute, but just so we have that idea that inverse functions, when we put them next to the original, they just cancel out. All right, so let's jump in now um, to talking about sine inverse and, and cosine inverse, and we're going to start just with a quick review of the original graph sine of x, okay? So y equals the sine of x, I've graphed for us right here, and we know that of course it goes on forever and ever and ever and ever, up and down, up and down, up and down, both directions, right? So if I were to ask you for the domain and range of this function, um, hopefully that's something that you can give me. Um, remember that the domain is all the possible x values that have points on the graph, the range is all the possible y values that we can get as, as our um, y values for the function. So when we look at the sine of x or the cosine of x, both of them are actually exactly the same. Um, they have a domain that's totally unrestricted. Okay, all real numbers, because if we think about them in terms of uh, the unit circle, remember that we can go around and, around and around and around and around and around and around the unit circle as many times as we want, right? So we can make an angle as big as we want or as big in the negative if we go the other way. So we have a domain, a totally unrestricted domain. I can put anything in for sine uh, into the sine and get a y value. 
sine of two, sine of three pi, sine of 47, sine of 683, it doesn't matter, they'll all work out okay. But the range for this function is very restricted, right? There's only specific values that I can get as my y value, right? So if we look at sine of x, this graph, the, in terms of the y axis, in terms of the y value, I repeat over and over and over again the same y values, right? And I never get higher than one, and I never get lower than negative one. So the range of sine of x is this, negative one, less than or equal to y, less than or equal to one, okay? This is a very restricted range, all right? So the range of sine or cosine is between negative one and one, which again should make sense from our unit circle because the unit circle, remember we call it a unit circle because it has a radius of one unit. So it goes down in the y to negative one and it goes up in the y to positive one, right? And remember, sine is our y values. So we talk about sine, we talk about y values. Same for cosine, if we look at our x values, it goes out to here to positive one and back to here to negative one. So cosine, if we think x direction on our unit circle, it's still between negative one and one because that's the radius of our circle, okay? So keeping this in mind about the sine of x, if you remember when we would flip to inverse functions, Right, when we flipped to inverse functions, what would happen to the y and the x when we flip to inverse functions? Well, they switch, right? Switch and solve is what we used to talk about. So the y and the x switch around for every single point on the graph, right? So all of these points, the y and the x switch around. The y and the x switch around. The y and the x switch around for every point. But that also means the domain and the range switch around, okay? So if I think about domain and range in terms of sine inverse of x, sine inverse, if I uh, go down here and I just write y equals sine inverse. Okay, if I go from the original function y equals sine of x to its inverse, what is the domain and range of uh, sine inverse? Okay, and that's sort of what number 20 a and b are getting at um, just forewarning we're going to go through a couple of problems from your book but we're not really going to answer exactly the parts that they have so um, when you submit your work just submit whatever notes that you took from this video um, and that'll satisfy me but there are a couple things i want to make sure that we write down so for 6-20a if we talk about the domain of sine inverse okay if we write down the domain of sine inverse what x values are we allowed to put in there, okay? Well, if we think about it in terms of, you know, the inverse of this function, the domain of the inverse should be this, right? This very restricted thing. And instead of saying y, I'm gonna say x. So the domain of sine inverse is negative one less than or equal to x less than or equal to one, which basically means I'm allowed to put into the sine inverse function any value between negative one and one, and I will get some y value back, okay? So if I go to my calculator real quick and I just look at um, second sine is my sine inverse, right? If I try any value that's not between negative one and one, let's say I try negative 3.2. Notice I get a domain error, right? I get a domain error. Well, what if I try it again with, uh, let's say I do 1.2. I still get a domain error because these values are not between negative one and positive one, right? So when I do the sine inverse, it's gonna be perfectly fine if I do anything between negative one and one, right? So negative 0.9 works out just fine, or positive 0.48 is gonna work out just fine, right? Or say sine inverse of, uh, if I could do like one fifth, one fifth is between negative one and one, right? That's gonna work out just fine. The same is true for cosine, right? If I do cosine inverse, and I'll just show you a quick example, cosine inverse of three, domain error, okay? So the domain means what values am I allowed to put into the function? So what I want you to think is, is the values that we are allowed to put into the sine inverse function are the possible sine values on our unit circle. 
okay, specifically negative one at the bottom to positive one at the top. That's what I'm allowed to put in. Now the range that I get back is really going to be the angles on my unit circle, okay? The pi over twos, the pi over fours, the three pi over fours, and so on, okay? So the range, these angles that I get back, if we think about it in terms of, again, the inverse of this function here, well, the domain of this function should become the range when I do the inverse. So the range should be, the range should be all real numbers, double stick fancy R, okay? My range got a little bit fancy too. I'll try to make that a little bit less fancy. The range of my function is all real numbers, okay? But that actually becomes a problem, all right? And, and, and we have to talk about why that's actually not okay. If I, if I look at the sine inverse on a graph, if you were to graph this function right here, y equals sine inverse of x, you would get something that looks like this. Okay, so notice it looks like a sine function that got tipped on its side. Um, it didn't exactly get tipped on its side, but it, it got reflected so that it becomes sort of a vertical sine function where it just goes back and forth wobbly like this across the y-axis over and over again. If I let the function continue forever in, in the y direction up and down, I want you to notice that it is absolutely not a function, right? Because remember, the func a function is supposed to pass the vertical line test, which means if I draw a vertical line, I'm only supposed to hit one point on the graph. But look at all the vertical lines that I could draw on this graph, right? And not only do I not only hit one spot, but if I kept these going forever, I would hit infinitely many spots, right? So, Really, when we think about it, for any sine value that I put into sine inverse, for any sine value that I put in here, there are infinitely many answers that the calculator should give me because I can go around and around and around the unit circle, right, and find infinitely many answers. That's what we were talking about in our last video when we added the 2 pi n, right? We had infinitely many answers for every time sine equaled a half or sine equaled zero or sine equaled anything, right? So, in order to deal with this and keep y equals the sine of x actually a function, what we do is we take this range and we restrict it significantly, okay? So the ranges should be all real numbers, but no. Okay, we have to restrict the range so that we get a function. And what we do is we basically just take the closest values to the origin and we slice off the function here we slice off the function here. Okay, and so in between these two values, we get this little curve, all right? So if we go to the calculator and I, and I just show you the graph of sine inverse. So go to y equals sine inverse of x. And I were to graph that for you. Notice that we only get a little piece of the graph. We just get a little wobble this way and a little wobble down that way, okay? So we, it restricts the range, the possible y values, so that we don't get all of these repeats going up the y-axis and all the repeats going down, okay? So what is the true range then, right? That's the real question. If we restrict the range, what do we restrict it to? Well, if you notice on this graph where I've cut it off, it's basically, look at my y-axis, notice it's going zero, pi, two pi, negative pi, right? If I restrict it here, this right here is halfway from zero to negative pi, so that is, negative pi over two, oopsies, I don't wanna do that. Negative pi over two, okay? And, um, and then at the top, right, up here, again, it's halfway between zero and pi, so that is positive pi over two. So this is my restricted range. Okay, so my restricted range is actually that y needs to be between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. So when your calculator gives you an answer, it will always give you an answer that's between negative pi over two and positive pi over two because it has to, otherwise it sort of freaks out that it's not a function and this is gonna repeat answers over and over and over again, okay? So your calculator is always going to give you one answer when you put sine inverse of whatever, okay? 
we're going to have to do a little bit of work to find the rest of the answers because trig functions still do have numerous values of x that will work for them. Um, so when we use the sine inverse, we're going to have to do a little bit of work. All right, so let's look at what that actually means um, and look at number 21 from your textbook, okay? So number 21 says, Zach is solving this equation. Zach with a C and no H and no K. Very cool name. He's solving this equation that sine of X is equal to radical three over two, all right? He's trying to figure out, okay, what are my values? So what he decides to do is he decides to do the inverse sign on both sides of the equal sign, all right? So he, he basically turns it into this, turns it into sine, uh, sine inverse of, sine inverse of the sine of x. Okay, so he takes the sine inverse and applies it on the left side. And then he also applies it on the right side. And so he writes sine inverse of radical three over two, okay? So he does the sine inverse on both sides and think about what that does to the left side of this equation, okay? Think about what it does to this side of the equation. Sine inverse of sine of x, that's what we just looked at on the previous slide, right? Those actually cancel each other out and we're left um, just with x. So this says x equals sine inverse of radical three over two. Right, so let's go ahead and do the sine inverse of radical three over two on the calculator and see what answer we get. So if I just clear all this out and I go sine inverse, uh, make sure you're in radian mode, by the way, if you're doing this, because we're still dealing in pi's and p pi's right on our unit circle. So we're dealing in radians. Sine inverse of square root of three divided by two. Um, some of you might have to close parentheses on that square root of three or something. Um, square root of three divided by two. If I hit enter, I get 1.04719755. Okay. So 21A says use your calculator to evaluate Zach's answer, sine inverse of radical three over two. Okay, we get that. 1.047. Verify that the answer on the calculator is the same as pi over three. So what the calculator is saying is, or what the problem is saying is your calculator did the decimal version we would probably do the pi version, right? So if I go second caret and I get the pi and I divide it by three, let's confirm that is the same thing, right? So the sine inverse of radical three over two is pi over three. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely, because that's where on our unit circle, the sine value is radical three over two, right? Radical three over two is up here. So, you know, if we just make ourselves a horizontal line from here going over, Right, we cross right here at pi over three. Okay, so pi over three is the value of x that makes this sine value. This is just what we did in our last video. But recognize that there should be more than one answer here, right? Not only should there be infinitely many answers as they go around and around, but there's actually two different answers just on the unit circle, right? So if I were to take this line and I were to, let's say, extend it this direction, I hit another point right over here, this point. And this point is two pi over three, right? So two pi over three is supposed to be another one of my answers, but the calculator didn't give me that answer, right? The calculator didn't give me that answer. Why is that? Well, remember, the calculator is only giving me answers between negative pi over two, which means the bottom of the unit circle, and positive pi over two, which means the top of the unit circle. So the sine inverse function, when you do it on your calculator, it cuts off the whole left side of the unit circle, and it just does the right-hand side of the unit circle. So you are gonna have to do the work to then figure out the other side, okay? So the sine inverse is always going to give you the answer, but it's not going to give you all of the answers. Okay, so on the calculator, we'll get an answer and then we'll talk in our next video about how do we, um, you know, find the other answer if it's not on our unit circle, okay? So, um, letter B, 
um, just ask why the calculator doesn't give us the two pi over three, right? And we just talked about that in terms of, well, it, it only gives me values on the right-hand side of the unit circle. Letter C in number 21 says, write the complete solution. Okay, well, if they want the complete solution, it's really pi over three plus two pi n, right? And it's also two pi over three plus two pi n. And then remember, we just write that n is an integer. Okay, so this is just what we did in our last video. We can still find all the solutions, pi over three, two pi over three, and then around and around and around the circle gives me all the answers, okay? Letter D, can you get the complete solution just from the calculator? No, you're gonna have to use your unit circle to do it, all right? Now let's briefly talk about the cosine function uh, and then we will uh, call, it, call it a day. So if we look at the cosine function, most, most everything is very similar, okay? When we go to cosine inverse, when we talk about y equals cosine inverse, If we were to look at the full graph, it would still be a wobbly, you know, going back and forth across the y-axis. So again, we have to restrict the range, okay? So for y equals cosine inverse, the domain of the function uh, is, is the same as it was for sine, where I can put in negative one to one, right? And we sort of talked about that because of what's happening over here on a unit circle, right? positive one to negative one are the possible cosine values I can get. So those are the values I'm allowed to put into the cosine inverse function. So the domain is still that. The range of cosine inverse though is slightly different than the sine, okay? Sine inverse, we had cut off the left-hand side of the unit circle and we're dealing with the right-hand side. For cosine, we actually cut off the bottom and we just deal with the top. Okay, so for cosine, remember, we would draw vertical lines right, we would draw vertical lines to find both answers where the x value, right, cosine is our x value, so we go vertically, vertical um, lines to find both answers on the unit circle. So what we do is we just cut off the bottom of the unit circle and we just deal with the answers on the top. So your calculator will only ever give you answers for cosine inverse that are between zero and pi. Okay, you will always get something between zero and pi. Zero to 3.14, whatever. No matter what you put in, you will always only get that. And that allows y equals cosine inverse to be a function for your calculator. Again, in our next video, we will talk more about how do we then use the unit circle to find all the answers um, of these more complicated trig functions, okay? So sine inverse, cosine inverse, your calculator is only giving you one answer. We eventually will be able to get all the answers um, to even crazy seeming trigonometric functions. All right. Um, if you have questions so far about sine inverse, cosine inverse, or their domains or ranges, what values are we allowed to put in? What values could we possibly get out from our calculator? Um, please let me know. Um, otherwise, like I said, submit whatever notes you have here. We certainly did go through all of number 21. Make sure that that's somewhere in your notes number 20, um, and then this cosine business is number 22, but we didn't do much of that. So just um, whatever notes you have, please submit. If you have questions, let me know. Um, otherwise, that's all I have for you right now, and we'll talk to you soon.